So my name is Joe Meir. I'm the community manager at Fairphone. And uh, our program for the morning is for me to do the first half. And then I'm going to introduce Chris from Kwame Corp. And he's going to be talking about the skin of the, um, the Fairphone skin on the OS. OK. So uh, uh, thanks for the introduction, Heinrich. Uh, Fairphone is a, a social enterprise based in Amsterdam. And um, I'm going to be giving the introduction, the history of, our, of the company, um, and sort of give you a background in, in what we've been doing and what we'll be doing for 2013. So I just want to start with this image. Does anyone have an idea of what this is? Toaster, yeah. Uh, it, it's actually a, an art project by Thomas Twites. Uh, he was uh, uh, at the Royal College of Art in 2010. And he sort of, he went to his corner store, found a toaster for four pounds and thought, this is too cheap. How could I be getting the toast that I love every morning with four pounds? Um, but maybe you wouldn't want to use this exact toaster. <laughs> for, your, for your toast, uh, because this is a homemade, made from scratch toaster. He, he went to the mines in the north of the UK, he, he smelted his own iron, iron ore, he went around, talked to people, figured out how to make his own toaster. And in, in the end, it was 250 times more expensive. It used over 400 different parts than, than the original. Um, and he was traveling over 2,000 miles to get to these mines uh, to make this toaster. So why do I, I know we're not, we're not talking about toasters today, we're talking about phones. But this, the connection between the Fairphone and the toaster is that every product has a story. And at Fairphone, we're trying to, to figure out the story behind this mobile phone, the phone that everyone uses on a daily basis. And by figuring out the story of the product, we believe that we can open up a system that's not very transparent, not very clear, uh, and sort of use the phone as a storytelling artifact. And then by doing this, we can also take shared responsibility, not just from the ODMs, the OEMs, the, the, the product manufacturers, but also um, the people who um, consume phones, the people who wait in lines to buy the phones, the operators, the carriers, everyone involved in this, this really complex supply chain. So like I said, we, we've seen some of this outside. We're really fanatic about our phones and technology and the latest, the greatest. And you know, some of my friends in New York would wait in line for the next iPhone, the, the next Samsung, everything. Uh, but we know that mobile phones don't grow on trees and that there's something, you know, a little more complicated about it and something that's not so right. So just through examples about the, the process and production of, of these mobile phones. Um, so from the, the very first iteration of the phone, the sourcing, you know, if I were uh, a teenager in the east of Congo, I could be an artisanal miner and I'd be lucky, lucky to be alive because there have been four million deaths so far in the east of Congo in the last 15 years because of, of the conflict there with armed guards trading these minerals. If I were uh, making, assembling these phones in China in a factory, I could be putting 900 labels on a phone charger in an, one hour, paid 75 euros a month. But we live in Europe and we have the luxury of throwing away over 15 kilograms of e-waste a year well, where it will probably end up somewhere like Ghana. So these are just some of the, some of the um, negative aspects, the, the kind of dirty things that we don't like to talk about. And there's been a growing movement to address these problems. And, you know, it's, it's kind of gone under the, the whole cloud of uh, green electronics, fair electronics. And so we feel like that it is time finally to address these problems. So uh, Fairphone started as a project at Vox Society. This is uh, not just another old building in Amsterdam. It's actually the, um, the offices of Fairphone and Vox Society. It was the, the first entrance um, the first entrance of goods in the 17th century uh, where they would weigh cheese and, and other materials before it would be traded with the rest of the country. Um, so it's a little play on 
you know, scaling and weighing cheese is not so lucrative nowadays. So they sort of switch between bridging art, science, and technology as a, a research institute. Um, so about two years ago, this project started uh, by Bas Van Abel, the founder, and um, and sort of grown since then. Uh, we started doing urban mining workshops, uh, mostly educational things around Holland. And so you see this is at a music festival, Lowlands. And uh, you know, it's, it's people when they're drinking beer, it's, it's pretty easy to take some old phones and bash them and figure out what, what's inside. You know, there's, there's 30 different minerals that go into it. So we would bring old phones, open them up, get people to touch it and really feel like they you know, open it up and, and feel like they own their products again. Um, and so around that time, two years ago, um, Boss did a fact-finding mission to Congo, to Kantanga in the south, to sort of see how would we start to source fair minerals in a conflict-free area, one that isn't surrounded by armed guards who are controlling the trade of the minerals. And so this mission um, sort of turned into um, the philosophy that the, the phone is the beginning, but it's not the end solution. The whole, the whole philosophy of Fairphone is that um, by, un by building a product, we can unfold the systems behind it. So this is uh, just a, sh let's see, so this is a, a mineral cobalt that are made into batteries, and this is a, a short film about, just a one minute thing about uh, our time in Katanga. Dignité, sa nature s'est due, son histoire est modula. L'homme et son paysage aimé, tout est là devant ses yeux, tout est dans les pas ou pas. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and we also do, uh, yeah, what I wanted to say about that is that, the, you know, we, we, when we went there, we met with ministers who would help us with these initiatives, and we feel like we have to include everyone in the process. Uh, this is another example of a design workshop we did a couple of years ago where people were making designs of prototypes and sort of just envisioning what, what a fair phone could be. It's very experimental. Most of the people involved at the beginning stages are makers and designers. Um, and uh, so it's, it's interesting to, to be in this atmosphere where it's, a, it's another step, another group of, of makers, designers, developers, thinkers. Um, yeah. So to make it a little more uh, concrete on what we're, what we're talking about with the Fairphone, we've divided it into five action areas. Uh, and I've already talked about the precious materials. Uh, there's also um, Made with Care, which is the, the way that our code of conduct would be when choosing a production partner in China. And we're still finalizing that choice now, and we're writing about it on the blog and um, you know, being very open and transparent about that, that choice. Smartly Designed is luckily what Chris is here to talk about. Um, in general, it means um, being, having an open, community-supported atmosphere where we welcome everyone. Uh, it sounds sort of like a marketing gimmick, but we can't build these things without other people. So we're very open to, to collaborative work. Uh, clear deals is the idea that you shouldn't buy a phone for like a dollar or fifty dollars. That there should actually be real, uh, the real price for the value put into the phone. And everlasting value is, like I said, the end of life phase and that something could end up in Ghana or Africa where it would only continue hurting people there instead of um, being recycled in the supply chain. And so like Kwame Corp, we also have a lot of, a lot of other uh, partnerships. Um, for the precious materials, we've um, We've focused on conflict-free tin and conflict-free tantalum. And luckily, there have been other big organizations like the Dutch government who started this conflict-free tin initiative. Um, and we're also looking into fair trade gold. And we're working with ActionAid for a fair trade cobalt scheme. But a lot of these things are just totally new. And they're going to take, maybe for cobalt, two to five years. Um, but other things like tin and tantalum are more concrete and will happen this year. Um, so that's why it's not a 100% fair phone. It's an ongoing process because it's so complex. 
Yeah, so we are actually making a phone. I always want to tell friends they're really confused, like, okay, are you an NGO? What are you doing? Are you, what do you, what, can I actually buy this phone? And but this isn't the phone either. <laughs> this is just a concept phone. Um, but yeah, I'm sort of teasing you. I can't give you all the details, but it's a, a mid-high range phone, around 300 euros. Um, it'll use Android Jelly Bean, but Chris will talk more about that. Um, one design aspect that we find really interesting is that it'll be dual SIM so that it'll have a longer value in secondhand markets um, because in places like Africa, the cell reception from one country to another is very you know, difficult to, to arrange. So it's easy to have two different SIMs per area or country to yeah, give a longer life to the phone. And um, I hope you've, you've heard of us, maybe. We've been getting uh, actually more press in Germany than in English-speaking markets. Uh, so we were in Spiegel. We also just got a piece by Arte in French and German. Uh, and then we've got, you know, like I said, uh, yeah, Future Zone, Depressa, and Austria. So we're getting a lot of momentum and uh, that we're always, you know, open to, to, to interviews and, and getting the word out. Um, so I, I see the goal, the, the big goal of Fairphone, if you think like where does it end, is sort of twofold. The first being that we want a, uh, an alternative to the current market, uh, an alternative Fairphone, to give people an option who want something fair, more conscientious, more something that's not so alienating in a way. Um, because we feel consuming is a political act, and by giving them this choice, they can have more power to, to be engaged in this, in this process. The second one would be that we're a catalyst for systemic change, and that's also why people ask us, why don't you just lobby the big companies, but it's because we feel like we want to get in the industry and you know, have, we're a small player, but we'll get more leverage than by making a, an actual phone. And so we, we're, we're starting small with 10,000 units this year, but um, we're only building an, more momentum as we go along. Yeah, and also, um, I don't know if you can see, we, we're always getting a ton of uh, user feedback from Facebook and Twitter. And I think for, for this audience, it's, it's really important to, to get your ideas about how a developer community can, can help us out and, and be useful for, for us and for you. And it's really interesting that um, we have uh, on our website over 10,000 subscribers who say they want a Fairphone, and almost half of those are from Germany. Um, it's really crazy. Also that our website isn't in German, so kudos to you for that. Yeah, so uh, before I finish up, I just wanted to step back and think about like, what, the, what the big message is for us. And uh, the project started as an idea that we should open up stuff, that we should find this product that we use the most and that is you know, sort of seemingly dispensable, or seem, you know, that is, but that it can be really um, you know, something tangible that we can fix. So we chose the mobile phone and we want to open up stuff and by open, opening that up we can understand the systems behind it. It's really complicated um, but we're, we're, it's a storytelling process um, and it's a big you know, communication challenge but it's, it's really fun to be able to tell the story and to get people involved to tell how they're involved with it. And finally uh, the sort of activists engage and take action. I mean, it's a little cheesy, but I think um, I'm here to get you involved, to tell you the story, and to, to make real change in connecting people and g getting involved with, with our story. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. And um, yeah, any questions at the end? Thanks. I have this one, give this to okay. you. Or give it back to you. <clears throat> so, hello, I'm Chris uh, from Kwame Corp. 
Um, and we are the company chosen by Fairphone to develop the Fairphone OS. Uh, before I start talking about what we exactly want to do about uh, Fairphone OS, I will talk a bit, a little bit about Kwame Corp. Uh, what is this? Um, why is it us? And um, how can we have the idea of doing or just taking part in such an uh, such an endeavor? So Kwame Corp is a digital R&D um, agency. <coughs> which creates end-to-end um, -end, uh, digital services and objects of desire. So um, R&D, this means um, we invent a lot of things, we have ideas. Um, I will go to the next space. Um, but we also uh, take a lot of care that we always do it end-to-end. -end. So we don't only want to stay in the wireframes and in the design and in the precious presentations. Uh, we really take care that we do um, projects uh, which we really then in the end launch to the market. So things, there you can see the full cycle. We start something and then we bring it and see it to life. Um, we exist now in three different locations. Uh, we are in London, in Lisbon and in San Francisco in the Silicon Valley. And uh, very soon this year we will open our next office in Seoul in Korea. Um, talking a bit more about our process of working which uh, sets us a bit apart from other agencies. Um, of course, first, we always can see that everything starts with a great idea, with an imagination, with something which is, yeah, which is always the, the spark, the, the initiation. Um, then we usually go through this um, triple play. Um, there is the user experience, there is the user interface, um, and then there is the prototyping. This is, for us, um, the biggest access. Um, once we do, uh, we come up with the wireframes and the idea, we very, very quick, we start to prototype and we touch it on the real device. So is it on the TV, is it on the computer, or nowadays, a lot of times, we just do it on the mobile phone. So that means 50% um, of our crew is actually developers. Uh, and a lot of the coding is obviously done in Android. Um, I want also to introduce here our CTO, who will be afterwards for the question and answers. He will be here. He is the responsible to take uh, Fairphone OS then really to the devices. Um, and yeah, he is obviously leading the crew who is doing the prototyping and taking care that the products are released to the market. So, uh, via frames, uh, user interface, we do prototyping, we test it, we test it first by ourselves, then we give it to some target groups, to some people who are interested in it, uh, we validate, we validate, we go back into the circle, we see like, ah, oh, it doesn't work, it doesn't work, it's sometimes always, you do have a great idea, you do a wireframe, you do a prototype, and then you test it out on your phone, and it's like, yeah, it wasn't really that, so we have to change it until we come up with something that's really good, and then we ship it out to the market, and be hopefully very successful. Um, some clients and projects, so we work for the, um, some of the biggest companies uh, on this planet. This is um, Samsung, where we work lately a lot. Uh, we work for uh, Nokia, Intel, we do some of the operators, Orange, Vodafone, um, BMW, some of the broadcasters, BBC, this is just um, a few pieces of our clients. Um, we worked a lot in operating systems, so this is kind of our specialty that we do operating systems and there is, um, I would say, few agencies uh, which I really can say that they are specialized and they did already uh, a lot of them. So we did a lot of work with Tizen. This was uh, during our work uh, we did with Intel. Um, we worked, uh, no, sorry, this was the Migo one. Uh, Tizen we do lately with Samsung. Um, we work obviously on all the touch with stuff which goes on on the Galaxy S3s and S4s. Um, sometimes also some projects which are only for 2015, 16, 2020. So we also do a lot of blue sky stuff, which is just inventing, where we don't even have the technology ready yet to know what we are doing there. Um, we do some projects, besides all these big clients, we do projects um, which we just do for ourselves. So there's Frame Blast, uh, this is in the, in the App Store to download. And then we do projects uh, like Khan Academy, where there's a lot of educational stuff. Um, Josiah Radio is a porcelain radio which can be bought in our, um, in our art gallery in Soho in London. Um, and we do projects that are just altruistic, and which is also a nice match uh, where we, when we met Fairphone for the first time, it was kind of love on first sight because it is a project where we really feel like this is something that we are burning for. This is something where we can really improve the world. It's not just 
getting a new phone out there which is a bit better, a bit faster, a bit quicker, a bit anything what nobody needs. So, um, talking about Fairphone and taking the bridge to Fairphone, um, Fairphone gives us actually the possibility of doing something different, uh, getting a different angle on our operating system, an angle um, which is, um, I think we can kind of uh, take it together into these three points. We want to do it uh, transparent and honest. We want to surface useful information useful information in a way um, that other operating systems they don't have the need or politically they are forced that they cannot do it. So if you look at iOS and even if you look at Android, they have to take a political stance that they say like we cannot, if something is not working we cannot really show it to the user. If something, if there's something consuming too much battery or something is not working properly we want to hide it because it's kind of admitting that the operating system is not working perfectly. We can take a step back and say like look we really want to show you what is really consuming a lot of battery on your device and you will be able just to delete the, the services which are running or to kill the applications. So we can have a different angle on this. Uh, the second thing we want to be obviously efficient and intuitive. This is, yeah, everybody who creates an operating system hopefully is saying he wants to be efficient and intuitive. Um, I think I'm very happy with the solutions we have for now and I will introduce them later that we found uh, some things where we really think or believe that we can uh, improve Android a lot. Um, the third part is uh, also interesting. Uh, we want to create a conscious system and we want to incentivate awareness. Incentivate awareness not only on the, on the hardware level from Fairphone where we say yes, uh, the phone and the minerals and the hardware is, is politically correct and is fair. We say if we have an angle like this, we, we can trust that our consumers and the people who will support Fairphone, that they also want to do something about themselves. So they want to use a phone in a conscious way. And that means um, that we maybe not only want to use a phone in a way that we say like we want to be all the time connected, we want to be all the time synchronized, our applications are updating all the time. Do we really need that? Do we really need to be all the time on our phones or is it that the phones control us and we don't control the phones anymore? So we think it's about time to do something against this. Um, I see couples in a restaurant and everybody is looking at his phone and they're not using the quality time and talking with each other anymore. Why is that? I mean, do we have to be so much connected? We think uh, we want to give the users some choices that we say, take a step back, relax, don't get into this new disease which is spreading everywhere around. It's called uh, nomophobia. So the fear of being without a mobile phone or not being connected to the internet or something. So this is one of the angles we want to introduce. Um, to um, explain exactly what we want to do with the things I have to do, I have to take three things which I want to explain first to, for you to better understand um, why we came to certain conclusions which we want to um, introduce into the Fairphone OS. So uh, one important thing is the desktop paradigm. <clears throat> The desktop paradigm, um, we have it, I mean, we saw it very much on the, on the iOS, which was uh, for sure uh, an amazing system. It's Apple, it's very closed, and I believe nobody in this room is very a big fan of iOS. But still, they were the first ones out there. They had the balls to do uh, a full touchscreen uh, phone where nobody else was out there. They had nobody to copy from. So they did something very good, and they enabled Android to do what we are doing. If you're seeing what is actually in a smartphone operating system, it's actually kind of dumb. I mean, there is, I mean, we have a very much smaller screen, we have a much smaller interface, but if you look at it, it's a very literal translation from what we have on our notebooks to our phones. So we have a big grid of never ending application icons on top. And on the bottom, we have this little bar where we can quick launch icons. Uh, Windows is not much different. We have the icons on our desktop where we can click and launch them. And then below, we have a little bar where we can launch icons. If you look at iOS, it is everything just a bit smaller. If you look at Android, uh, the difference is also not that big. Even BlackBerry as a new modern system didn't make such a big difference. Um, a phone, if you think about a smartphone, how much times do we actually use to call people? I mean, of course, it is an important function, but 
we use it much more nowadays to surf on the internet and to read our emails than, than we actually do phones. Do we really need to see uh, the dialer app on each pane which we are scrolling left and right? Do we always have to see these four icons there? Um, we believe not. We think it's time to take a different stand. And if you look at modern uh, of, uh, systems which come out lately, like Windows 8, um, they took that stake and they said, like, this is not necessary anymore. We don't need to do this. So um, I want to compare here a horizontal with uh, vertical systems. Um, I don't say that the vertical systems, even if all modern operating systems have a vertical approach, I don't say this is the only answer, but it's very useful to be able to have some vertical approaches in the operating system. So if you look at Android and iOS, which, were, which are the oldest, which are the dinosaurs in the operating system market, because they were just the first, they have never-ending rows of icons and widgets, and one pane comes after the next pane, and the user sometimes doesn't know where he is and where it goes. Vertical systems uh, like Migo Jolla, this was the only Migo system launched by Nokia. Uh, the Android Aquas, uh, this is um, an Android flavor designed by a frog agency for Sharp. Um, and even some parts of the BlackBerry, of the BlackBerry 10, they use vertical approaches and we think a vertical approach it's something very nice. Um, also, if you look at the screen layout, the mobile phone is usually used in portrait mode and not in landscape mode, so it's much easier for us to scroll long lists on a vertical mode. Um, yes. The next thing I want to talk about is widgets. Widgets. Everybody loves widgets um, or not. Um, they are um, usually a lot of widgets on one screen. Um, they can be visually very confusing. They are all stuck to the system grid, and um, we think too much widgets on one screen cannot be the answer. Uh, we think there's something to do to put. We love widgets. We don't want to get rid of them, but we think we have to put them in the right place. Um, and our answer is: Why don't we use widgets for a full window? So, in the way that we take this quick launcher out of Android, this four or five icons. Uh, we can windows, we can make uh, widgets in a way that they occupy the full window. Um, and if they would occupy the full window so that we make the rim very, very thin, as small as possible, we can create widgets, uh, if they occupy the whole screen, that we can actually create a complete vertical layout. And the beautiful thing is, it's completely, fully Android compatible. So just by putting different widgets on your Android system and by um, customizing it by the client, the system architecture of Android can completely change. And I think uh, this is the base for everything what we want to do for Fairphone. And this is um, nothing less than a little revolution. Um, the other advantage is we keep, if the full the pane is one complete widget, we keep the user completely focused on what's going on there. It's not like 10 little widgets and everybody is competing for your attention. Um, a widget can even seen as, can be seen as an app. I will show this on my next slide. And it gives the developers much more freedom on what they can do. Um, we can easily imagine that we have um, a calendar function as one of the widgets that it's full, I just swipe to the left or to the right and I would see my full calendar functionality with my full interaction possibility. Because if you think a widget is very interactive, we can do a lot of stuff inside of a widget. The only things uh, which we can't do is a horizontal scroll because this would change us from one pane to the next. And the other thing we can't do is a long press. This is the only two actions which are forbidden. All the rest we can do inside of a widget, which is a lot. Um, we can easily imagine that we have a social feeds app, something even similar to the, to the BlackBerry comms hub. Um, and just having a full email application, I think it's kind of a no-brainer to think that this would be something nice if I don't have to go to a widget where I see the updates, but then I have to tap to then again open and launch the email application to do actually the stuff I really would like to do. Um, from this, so this was the, the, the point I wanted to explain. This is the base, what we want to change in the Fairphone OS. And I'm coming now to um, some of the functionalities we want to integrate into Fairphone OS. So um, about transparency and to be honest. Uh, on the lock screen, we envision um, a system where we can see, uh, we see this on these little drops, where we have a system where we can see that the, which services and applications are currently running on the system and how much battery is actually drained. I think everybody uh, of you already had the Maps application or some navigation running and 
two hours later, he watched the phone and the battery was completely drained. So we want to be completely transparent what is running on your system and also to create some consciousness of how much battery is actually consumed and is this really necessary to incentivate a more aware behavior. How is your, how is your telephone used? So if we see this directly on the lock screen, we can easily drag these applications which are consuming the most battery and we drag them up and we would relieve uh, the strenuosity on the system with this little belly which is created. So the belly will be hanging deeper as more applications are draining on the battery. Um, the peace of mind button. This will be a widget we want to put uh, directly on the home pane. This is something I talked um, before when I introduced the conscious behavior and the conscious uh, usage of a, of a smartphone. So. This is the first step. Uh, this I have to say, we we will develop this in various phases, and this is just the, the first phase. And we will we have already a lot more ideas how to develop this further. On the first phase, we just want to do something simple, like a piece of mind button that we say there is one single tap, and you will stop all synchronization and online and data connection, and it will actually count. So this goes into the into the into the area of the quantified self, where everything is measured by itself, and it's kind of a gamification factor that uh, the times uh, you are actually offline and you are not synchronizing is counted and you can set your own margin that you say like, I say I want to be four hours per day, I want to be offline. And this will be like uh, probably something very hard to achieve already. So it's one single tap on the home screen and you say, okay, I'm offline and I'm really happy about it. You will still be able to receive the important calls and this, uh, the SMS, but everything with email synchronization and all the rest, all the WhatsApp and all those other things will be just completely off. Um, then everybody is right now, or at least some of you will be wondering, um, if we take these buttons out, if we take the quick launch bar out from the, from the, um, from the home panes and from, from the first level of the operating system, uh, where will they be? Because we still need a task launcher, we need the, uh, we need the app launcher, and we need, um, we need the favorite apps. Uh, we just the, the app launcher, we will need to be tier 2 compatible with Android, otherwise uh, they will not give us um, the right permissions to use the App Store and the Maps application and everything what uh, Google uh, provides as services. So uh, we want to integrate this simply as an edge swipe. You come in an edge swipe and you will see these applications which are usually right below on the bottom of your, of your screen. Uh, edge swipe is meanwhile so integrated in so much applications that it's almost um, a best practice pattern to use it. Um, this will be one of the biggest and also the last functionality I want to introduce here. Um, as I say, this is phase one. Uh, we don't know which exactly uh, which of the functions will enter phase one and which of them will go into phase two. Um, but here we want to do something about this never-ending ocean of applications. So we install one application after the next and our task launcher, our application launcher is just growing and growing. Uh, we want to do something um, new about it. Uh, and I say very new. So on the right side of the home pane, we will see um, our dynamic app launcher. The dynamic app launcher is one part uh, of our Android task switcher as we know it. But the task switcher would only take care for the latest, for the most recent launched applications. What we integrate here in the second column is um, the applications you actually mostly use. So uh, there will be a simple service which just counts each launch of each application and then he says this is the applications which are really valuable for you. And this is not the applications you think they are valuable for you because you drag an icon and put them on the home screen. Usually we drag the icon there and then we forget it and we never use it again. This takes care for us and this will be one swipe to the right and we will see, I would say to 90 to 95 percent we will find all the applications we will need. Only when we go to an application which we didn't use for two or three months, then we really have to go to the app launcher and we have to find it out. Um, there's one part missing, um, um, which is very important. So I mentioned we don't exactly know if everything goes already into phase one. Uh, some of these things will be um, only ready for phase two. Uh, if it's phase two, Kim Hansen will be responsible for it. <laughs> Um, but we also want to do something about uh, sharing in this community character and uh, it's very important that um, we have you guys on board for all this. We want, don't want to do this alone and we don't just want to present it to you and give it to you. So one thing which is 
which we hope um, that your collaboration will will be very fruitful. We want to release everything what we do uh, as open source. Uh, each widget and any code which will be created for Fairphone OS will be released, and um, everybody of you is very invited to take part in creating a kick-ass operating system. Thank you. <laughs>